The United Kingdom is calling for an end to the war in Yemen, and yet its military and defence industry is still playing a crucial role in continuing the conflict. Is it time for this country to be honest about its role in the war? You're watching Roundtable. Hello and a very warm welcome to the programme from me, David Foster. The crisis in Yemen has been called the world's worst humanitarian disaster and Britain has a hand in it. Since the start of hostilities, it's sold billions of dollars of arms to Saudi Arabia and its workers helped to keep the Saudi bombers flying. How can you say you want it all to end when it appears you're putting profits before peace? <laughs> The war in Yemen has cost thousands of lives and created a humanitarian crisis. And it is partly Britain's war. UK sales of weapons to Saudi Arabia have spiked since the war began. And there are claims that the Saudis may have been using British missiles to cause civilian casualties. British technicians working for the UK's biggest defence contractor are working on air bases in Saudi Arabia, keeping Saudi jets in the sky as this deadly conflict goes on. More than 70,000 have been killed. An estimated 85,000 children under the age of five have died from extreme hunger or disease. And up to 14 million people are at risk of famine. The UK has sold licenses worth at least $5.9 billion of arms exports to Saudi Arabia and around one billion to its coalition partners since the start of the war. Theresa May's refusal to curb weapons exports have been condemned by critics in Parliament who say the government is on the wrong side of international law. Across Europe, several countries have stopped selling arms to Saudi Arabia. Is the UK putting profits before lives? With me today from Beirut, we have Christine Beckley, who's legal director for Mawatna, a Yemeni human rights organisation not long back from the country. Here in the studio, Chris Doyle, director of the Council for Arab and British Understanding. Paul Stott is with us from the Henry Jackson Society. And Andrew Smith from the Campaign Against the Arms Trade. Um, Andrew, I'll come to you first of all. Campaign Against the Arms Trade is, is taking the UK government to court, expecting an announcement fairly soon from the... Uh, appeals court. Uh, we'll go into the details of that in just a moment, if I may, but you've studied the uh, extent of Britain's arms involvement, weapons involvement in Yemen. Um, tell us what they have out there at the moment that is of British origin. For decades now, Saudi Arabia has been by far the largest buyer of UK arms, and many of those arms are being used in Yemen right now. UK-made fighter jets are flying over Yemen right now. They are being flown by pilots who've been trained by the UK. They are firing missiles which are made here in the UK. We're talking specifically typhoons or other planes as well? It's tornadoes and typhoon yeah. jets, um, which have been made over the course of decades. But the missiles which are being fired are paveway missiles um, and brimstone missiles which are made here in the UK. And the results have been devastating. We've seen the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. A UN estimate has shown that if things continue as they are, by the end of this year, 230,000 people will have been killed in this war. And, and there are British advisers out there as well? Yeah, we don't know the full details of the role of the UK personnel who are over there. For example, we were always told there isn't any military personnel, but an investigation from the Mail on Sunday found Special Forces soldiers having been wounded over there, which does raise questions about the role. But we do know that UK personnel are involved in the maintenance of the weapons, and we do know that this war could not be fought without UK and US-made weapons. I indeed, there was a TV programme about this not so very long ago, a former worker at British Aerospace, I think it's called BAE now, which makes the missiles. Mm. Uh, and It says if it weren't for um, our people, in 7 to 14 days there wouldn't be a jet in the sky because they need them to keep them going as well. So that's another side of it. Well, yeah, in that programme, the work in question said that 95% of the work had been done by... Um, their personnel, with the final 5% being done by the Saudis. So there is a very thin line between the work which is being done by those who are selling and maintaining the weapons and those who are using them. OK, so, so support staff, possibly special forces, uh, missiles, 
uh, and fighter bombers. Can I, can, can I go to Christine now? Because you'll, you'll tell me, Christine, when you were last there, but you believe that you and your team have found absolutely incontrovertible evidence that British missiles have been used uh, and caused human, uh, civilian casualties. Yes, yeah, so basically, I mean, Mawathana is based in Yemen. They have 70 staff people, men and women, based across the country that go to the sites of airstrikes after they happen and investigate the attacks. Earlier this year, Mawathana released a report called Day of Judgment, where we looked at attacks where we were able to identify U.S. or U.K.-made remnants. And the kind of crystal clear point that comes across from that report is it's not a question of whether or not U.K. weapons are being used anymore. It's not a question of risk. They are being used. So Mawathana has documented five attacks where U.K. weapons were used on civilian targets, and they've documented around two dozen where U.S.-made weapons were used. And these attacks have killed and wounded civilians, destroyed civilian objects. And I think a thing to really emphasize is that it's incredibly difficult at the site of an attack to actually identify and then take a weapons remnant and go back to the country of origin. So when we're talking about five or two dozen, that's actually a startling number and makes very, very clear that the UK position right now is untenable when it comes to complying with its own domestic and international legal obligations in regards to arms transfers okay. to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Christina, I'll come back to you and ask you about the humanitarian situation a little bit later in the programme, if, if I may. But, Paul, is there any moral case for selling these weapons to, to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen? I know there's a financial case because jobs depend upon it, but is, is there any kind of moral case? Well, there certainly is that financial case. I think before we tackle the moral case, we need to sort of take a step back and recognise some of the, the regional realities here, that Saudi Arabia is the, is the regional power, and it's very unlikely that it's going to allow that position to be challenged on its border, uh, and indeed uh, allow a position to be challenged by, uh, by Iran. Now, Britain could potentially step away, uh, as activists would like, from that um, relationship in terms of uh, uh, supplying the, uh, the arms. Um, the reality, though, is plenty of other countries would simply step into that void. I, I understand the, French, I understand the, the Americans, financial whoever. case, and I yeah. will go into that, I promise yeah. you. But, but, I, but I, I it's also a moral case. I want to ask case. you the moral case. So I, I think we need to get a clear statement from the government what the British interest is here. And until we get that, the moral case is questionable. How can a government say it wants the war to end and yet be providing the fuel for the fire? Well, you have to consider the historic British approach towards Saudi Arabia, which I think Andrew Green, former uh, Saudi ambassador, summed up, which was that it, it's desirable to keep uh, Saudi Arabia away from the, the front page of the newspapers and that that's the key to the relationship. Britain looks to exert relationships behind the scenes and at times that's been a, a profitable relationship politically and uh, obviously uh, in terms of, of business. The danger, if you like, if we step away from that relationship, is we lose any potential to influence at all. OK, you haven't put forward a moral argument uh, in these answers. Is there an immoral case for selling arms to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you, you, heard, you heard that case put forward sometimes with regards to Syria, that, you know, all, all these guys are baddies, so let's just let them carry on fighting. You can't make that immoral case when you see the, uh, the degree of suffering uh, in Yemen, as, as I'm sure we'll hear uh, later in the, in the programme. It's unacceptable. OK. Um, help me with this one, Chris, if, if you would. It's, it's a financial argument, this one, and it's, it's a bad influence as well if you step away from the table. How much is this worth, do you think, uh, to keep the relationship going with Saudi Arabia rather than pulling out for a moral argument and damaging relations in the long run? Well, financially, it's worth billions, of course, and it's worth jobs. I mean, that's clear. And we we've had and we've heard you know, discussion of the extent of that relationship that stretches back decades. But, you know, there's a cost also here as well. I mean, we go into, that, you know, into Yemen and there is a, a, a massive humanitarian uh, disaster that's brought about, you know, by exacerbating this conflict. Uh, there's going to be a cost in terms of, you know, refugees and ongoing reconstruction, etc. Uh, there's going to be a cost to our reputations as well because we have not uh, uh, taken a stand. And you look further forward, uh, this is not the only conflict in the region and we could be getting into a conflict, certainly a very dangerous situation uh, with Iran as well, with Saudi and Iran confronting each other. So I think there is a question as to you know, 
can Britain really play a role if it's actually taking sides in these conflicts? And I think that's one of the big problems, is that right from the start, we decided effectively, because of financial interests, not necessarily because of moral or legal ones, to take sides. And we weren't able to take a step back and say, right, how do we get all these parties together, round the table to resolve a conflict, which anybody who knew Yemen very well could see could be utterly disastrous. This is the poorest country in the region. It's the richest countries in the region that are fighting against it, essentially. Has the bill from Saudi Arabia to the UK for its weapons and its personnel increased since uh, MBS, the Crown Prince, came in? In other words, <laughs> is, is he pushing a more aggressive agenda out there? And Britain is perhaps helping with that. Uh, certainly, MBS is pushing a more aggressive agenda, not just in Yemen. I mean, he's up the ante in terms of Iran. He's done it in terms of, of Lebanon, where we saw the Lebanese prime minister was effectively under house arrest internally in terms of the way in which he cracked down on corruption, which was really a cover for a shakedown of many of leading Saudi princes. So there were, you know, a lot of issues. And, of course, we saw the, uh, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Now, he personally denies he had anything to do it, but people very close to him had. But I, I suppose what I'm suggesting is it, it, we're expressing moral outrage about a number of things, including the killing of Jamal Khashoggi um, and, and the war in, in Yemen, and yet perhaps we're profiting even more from uh, the new effective ruler's position when it comes to conflict in the Middle yeah, East. In, in the short term, you can make that argument, but I think there is a medium to long-term fallout in which we'll pay a very, very heavy cost. Now, it should be said, for, for the sake of balance, that you know, the Houthis uh, are no angels in all well, this. And we should Iran point out that the, the Houthis are Iranian-backed. And they're Iranian-backed, and they fired audience. missiles into Saudi Arabia, yeah. so it's not that, you know, all part... It's not a black-and-white situation, but I think that we should have been in a situation of trying to resolve this much, much earlier. It's only really been in the last 12 months, perhaps even less, that Yemen has really risen up the agenda. But before that, we were content to largely ignore what was going on, perhaps because of other reasons, perhaps because Yemen seemed distant and far, distant and far off. Do, do you get it, Christine, um, what Paul was saying about it? If, if Saudi doesn't get its weapons from Britain, it'll get them from somewhere else. You know, that argument's made a lot, but I think it ignores how integrated a lot of these contracts are in terms of the weapons themselves and maintenance. And that's why um, the work that's been done in the UK by journalists, for example, on the role of BAE, beyond just providing the jet, but also the maintenance for years and years and years, it makes that argument a little less powerful in that the notion that if you just pull the plug on new contracts, then all of a sudden they can fill it with new products. It's not true because there's so much integration with the weapons and the way in which they're used uh, from the original supplier. That, in addition, even if the argument were true, it doesn't change the fact that the UK is risking complicity in some of these awful attacks by continuing to provide weapons and other military support to the Saudi-led coalition. So I think listening to people speak around the table, nobody is disagreeing about the way in which the Saudi and Emirati-led coalition is waging this war. Nobody is disagreeing about the extent of the humanitarian crisis and the role the coalition has played in that crisis. And so, really, if nobody can make a moral argument for why the UK should continue selling weapons to the Saudi-led coalition, it kind of strikes me as, then why would you not stop? And uh, Let me ask you about your court case. I think you have a point you want to make first, but I want to ask you about the legal side of this. And, and any time you want to say something, don't wait for me. Yeah, on the legal side, we believe these arms sales aren't just immoral. We believe that they're also illegal. UK arms export criteria is very clear. It says that if there is, and I quote, a clear risk that weapons might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law, an arms sale should not go ahead. Now, Saudi forces have been accused of some of the most serious breaches of international humanitarian law, time and again since this terrible war began. At the moment, the Court of Appeal is considering the legality of these arms sales, and we expect to hear more in, about their verdict in the weeks ahead. And, and your argument is simply that if there is a clear and present danger to civilians or the, um, the wrongful use of, of these weapons, then it, then it is illegal. If you win your case, what would be the position of the British government? Uh, it would probably appeal, but where do you think the British government would then stand legally? We would hope that the UK government would then suspend all licences for arms being used in Yemen and carry out a full investigation as to if UK weapons have been used in a serious violations of international humanitarian law. Because there have been so many of these breaches which have been alleged by uh, some of the most respectable 
NGOs and non-government organisations in the world. And yet the Saudi regime, which is one of the most brutal dictatorships in the world, it is one of the most appalling human rights records in the world, not just in Yemen, but in Saudi Arabia as well. And somehow the UK government is entrusting it to investigate itself for war crimes. The idea is utterly farcical. Uh, do, do say whatever's on your mind, but my question is, I mean, if other European countries can stop arms sales to Saudi Arabia, why can't the UK? It there's the question of whether it would make any, uh, any difference given the geopolitical realities that we've been in now for, for several years. The uh, US-Iran deal, uh, nuclear deal, rather spooked uh, the Saudis and the UAE. And I think they both realised from there that, um, from then onwards, that the Americans weren't necessarily going to provide them uh, with, uh, with a shield. And um, ever since then, they've been much more aggressive militarily. They've looked to uh, solve problems through force. And that isn't likely to change uh, in the, the short to medium but, but term. If, but if it, other it, countries can stop sales, um, on grounds of the moral dilemma. Mm. Uh, why can't the UK? Uh, well, the UK government's perfectly free to take that decision if that's where, where public opinion leads it to, towards. My argument very much is, is, is if you like, the, the realist position, Saudi Arabia is going to prosecute this conflict. I would challenge this. Um, it has In a minute, Chris, yeah, yeah. It has to be said that when, it looks, when we look at European governments, most of European governments that have stopped the arms sales have been far smaller arms producers in the UK and have been selling So it's not going to hurt them financially weapons that much? That, well, they've also been selling weapons which are far less central to the bombardment. But what we did see when Germany took the step of bringing an arms embargo was actually a huge deal of pressure being exerted by Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, who was effectively asking, who was effectively working as a representative of BA Systems, lobbying the, government, the German government to reverse its position because it was potentially damaging to UK arms companies. OK, Chris, sorry. I, I think that it's, it's much easier for these European governments that don't have large defence contracts to, to take a moral stand. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, you know, if it was France or Germany who had the extent of the relationship, I, I question whether they would take the uh, uh, a moral decision to, uh, to suspend arms sales. But I think there's a practical issue. We've heard the moral and legal arguments. There's a practical issue about the, uh, what is going on in Yemen and the way this war is being conducted. It is not working. And, you know, aside from all the other reasons, which I think are ex excellent arguments, the moral and the legal humanitarian, simply Saudi Arabia is bogged down. I mean, you know, it, it is not winning this, nor are the Emiratis. It is in a stalemate that is costing millions of people uh, their lives, their livelihoods, it's a disaster, and we need to find this escape route. So actually, sending out a clear message by suspending arms sales, etc., putting pressure on all parties, you've got to make a deal, you've got to make those painful compromises, I think is essential. It's as much as practical uh, measures as well. And I think that the Saudi Arabia will worry about losing its relationship with its key backers of the United States and, and, and Britain. I think it is worried about the way in which Senate and you know, the House of Representatives you know, voted uh, uh, against uh, arms sales, okay, Donald Trump vetoed. I think it would be worried. It does worry about its status in the world. Look at the way that it fell out with Canada and its ongoing uh, spat with, with Germany. And I think the message goes out, not every problem in the region has to be dealt with by a hammer. Should we, should we look at the different role of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates I in this? Because, well, they have, it, because they, 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 they're on the same side, but they're not necessarily fighting for the same reasons, perhaps? Yeah, they have divergent uh, reasons. Um, Saudi Arabia, of course, you know, historically, has always had a very key interest in, in Yemen. It sees it, it as a vulnerability to, to Saudi Arabia. This low-income, high-level population, the the first king of modern-day Saudi Arabia, you know, warned about Yemen as being a strategic threat to Saudi Arabia. The Emirates are a, a later arrival to the whole sort of game over, uh, over Yemen, because Saudis have fought there before in the 60s uh, uh, and so forth. But they are keener, for example, on uh, the succession of the South. So, uh, of course, Yemen was a divided country for, for many years between North and South. And that they are actually keener to keep um, Muslim Brotherhood-style organisations, in the case of Yemen, ISLA, out of the political picture. The Saudis are more uh, relaxed uh, about that, so they have differing agendas there. Different. Okay, but, but is Britain selling arms to the Emirates as well? We do send, sell okay, arms so, to the so, Emirates. So the same question asked, why don't we stop sending arms to them as well? 
I mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I mean, I think if it was arms that are going uh, towards the Emirates that are being then used in, in Yemen and that they are being used and evidence has shown that they're being used in, in war crimes, then I think the same arguments must apply. But in many ways, the spotlight is on Saudi Arabia and much less Because it's the a Emirates. much bigger... Much bigger uh, there's economy. a difference in soft power as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the UAE soft power and in this country is very good. Also, short. I mean, Saudi Arabia's, frankly, its reputation in, 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 in Britain and, and, and in the West for a long time has been extremely poor, and the Emirates has been... And, of course, uh, if you stop selling arms to the, to the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, somebody's going to say, well, hang on, you've got to do the same with Saudi Arabia, so you're damned if you do, damned if well, you I don't. Well, I think it puts a question mark against the whole arms industry, of course. <coughs> so you know, if we get into that debate. Um, but certainly on the Yemen, we should not, in my view, be supplying to, to any side um, you know, uh, to, to get this conflict yeah. resolved. But the UK arms industry is an incredibly regionalised industry. Every year, roughly 60% of all arms exports will go to one region, which is the Middle East. If we look at the war in Yemen, the UK has licensed roughly £7 billion worth of weapons to the Saudi-led coalition since it began. The vast majority have gone to Saudi forces, although, um, the, although UAE is a very large buyer, uh, Bahrain is a large buyer, if we look to the wider region, Qatar is a large buyer, so is Amman, but Saudi Arabia is by far the largest and playing let's, the largest Let's go to Christine role. and get, the, get a status report on, on the country itself. Uh, world's perhaps biggest humanitarian disaster, although there are some moves to, uh, to get the Houthis out of Hodeidah. There are some peace talks, pr preparatory peace talks going on. But it, it, are things getting worse by the day? Quick answer, yes. So two points on what the table's been discussing. So first of all, are things getting worse? I mean, there's been this sort of odd narrative that things are improving, but that's completely wrong, right? Last Thursday, uh, the Saudi led coalition carried out another strike in Fana where they hit a family home and they killed about a half dozen children, wounded about 16. And a lot of people will say, well, we've heard this story before, but the fact is it's not a story. It's a family. It's another family on top of the thousands that have already been killed and wounded and attacked by both the Saudi led coalition and the Houthis. On the UAE, I want to come in on this point particularly because from Muatama's perspective, absolutely the UK should suspend weapon sales to the UAE. And I make that point for two reasons. One, when we look at what we know about the UAE's role in Yemen, we A, know that they are in fact carrying out airstrikes and B, Muatana, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International have also documented the UAE's role in awful detention-related abuses, torture, arbitrary detention, and forced disappearances across South Yemen. And the UAE has really gotten away a little bit scot-free in terms of hiding behind the notion of the Saudi-led coalition in terms of the public discourse on Yemen. So absolutely, the UK should suspend weapons sales to Saudi Arabia, but that should also then be followed by the UK suspending weapon sales to the UAE because they're a major player when it comes both to violations in Yemen as well as whether or not we're going to see peace and an end to this conflict. OK, can, can I ask you specifically about Britain's yeah. reputation, Britain's relationship with that part of the world and, and what could happen depending on where it decides to fall? Well, I think actually the great debate of the day is really does the international community such as it is, does international rights, international norms mean anything right now? And we see that uh, the current White House, Trump administration, and various other countries like Putin's Russia are riding roughshod over this. So I think there is a question. You know, does Britain actually care about these sorts of things? Do we actually want to stand up for this and Security Council resolutions and the importance and centrality of uh, multinational institutions? I think that matters. I think that given the horrendous scenes in Yemen, and that we are, we're, it's not like Syria, we have a much more uh, participative role in this, um, that actually people in the region are looking at Britain. They're hoping that we are going to address this with But sense. we will and remain not, hypocrites, will we? And we will remain hypocrites. And just at one point, it's not quite like previous conflicts nowadays, because <clears throat> if you go back to the 1970s or 80s when you had conflicts, we were some way, somewhat shielded from the after effects. Nowadays, this is not the case. We actually, there's another practical argument. We talk about extremism, where extremism is incubated in these conflict areas like Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Mali. Um, it spreads elsewhere, it metastasizes. And we also get also the issue of refugees and so forth. So we're not immune to these conflicts. They are going to impact us. They are going to impact 
it could be a risk also to uh, trade routes, particularly going through the Babel Mandab Strait. So these are serious issues we can't just ignore and just hope eventually the conflict will just die out. We should be trying to end it. But, but having watched this conflict since the very start uh, and seen Britain's involvement with it condemned many, many times, nothing's going to change, is it? Well, we're very good at issuing, you know, pro forma press releases, so though um, pretty light touch when it comes to certain key allies like Saudi Arabia. But nothing's going to change, it does. is it? Uh, no, the question is whether anything is going to change. Possibly not, and also with the distraction of, of Brexit and the debate that's going on in Britain, uh, there's the likelihood of a, a, a leader in this country taking a, a really tough decision, which this would certainly be, is probably quite low. Listen, thank you all very much indeed. Christine, very depressing. I mean, it's been years now since we started talking about this. Um, Andrew, the results of your court case now in the next couple of days, we will undoubtedly report that here on TRT World. But for now, that is the end of our discussion about the UK's role in Yemen. From me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team, and from my guests, thank you for watching. Goodbye.